character became hugely popular, to the point where Chaplin was able to demand that he directed his own films. Which all sounds utterly simple. But why did Chaplin think, however naturally, of a tramp? And why did this character become the most popular figure on the planet? Well, in the years before the First World War, a new age was developing. In England and America, vast factories owned by businessmen like Henry Ford now dominated people's lives. In opposition to this new elite, the industrial workers of the world recruited tens of thousands of workers and a major part of their opposition was a reverence towards tramps who were seen as honourable for having somehow opted out of the monotony of the modern workplace. Factory workers looked up to the supposed freedom of the tramp and one of the most popular songs of the time went Alleluia, I'm a bum. In February 1914, a mob of 700 tramps burst into a church in Manhattan demanding food and shelter. A mass rally of the IWW supported them and urged tramps to occupy churches across America. Chaplin probably didn't consciously pick the figure of the tramp with all of this in mind, but he must have been aware that he was developing a character that would be seen as a symbol of resistance against the regimented rules of modern society. To start with, you can see from the titles of his films in this period who he was aiming them at. The Fireman. The Pawn Shop. The Vagabond. In work, Chaplin has to push a cart up a hill with all his tools in it, while his boss sits on the cart whipping him and then offers his huge friend a lift on the cart as well. In The Immigrant, the immigrants are roped into one corner of the boat in terror at the precise moment as they sail past the Statue of Liberty. The character jumps at any job that he can get, including becoming a policeman in the film Easy Street. But even then, he uses his position to steal food from shopkeepers, which he gives to the poor. Chaplin's policeman stumbles across a junkie who's holding a girl captive. He accidentally sits on one of the junkie's needles and then in his drug-addled state he somehow gets the courage to confront the junkie and rescue the girl. <laughs> to many people, Chaplin must have seemed like our man in their world. It's impossible to fully comprehend what these films meant to people, just as you can't entirely grasp what punk meant to a 16-year-old in 1976, unless you were there. It's no good saying to a modern teenager, think about it, we're so pretty, oh so pretty, vacant. Can't you see what that meant to us? As well as the radicalism, Chaplin transformed the way in which comedies were made. Before Chaplin, it was unheard of in a comedy to shoot the same scene twice, as this was considered an extravagance, not only a waste of money, but a waste of film. Subtleties and subplots and images on top of the story, such as the use of the Statue of Liberty in The Immigrant, were new ideas to film audiences, especially in comedy. Now, the amazing thing about Chaplin's fame at this point was that he had no idea how famous he was until he got a train to New York, and every time it stopped, there was a huge reception involving the whole town waiting outside. When he arrived in New York, the chief of police told him not to get out at Grand Central Station as they couldn't control the crowds. And when he returned to London, one newspaper headline said, Homecoming of comedian to rival Armistice Day. Fame then wasn't like it is now, when most people who are famous aren't famous for anything they've done, but for just being on things. Fame now can be a sign of failure, of having given up. Like, I can't believe that one day a few years ago at drama school there was an actor who said, I may be just a drama student now, but one day it shall be I. I who stands poised on set, preparing to transmit my words to millions before gazing into the camera to say... Elephant.co.uk. It couldn't be simpler. But, in some ways, Chaplin did become a modern celebrity. He started going out with the Czech beauty queen, and he became incredibly wealthy. The contract that he signed with Mutual Films was for $13,000 a week, which made him the second highest paid person in the whole of America after the president of US Steel. 
By the time he signed for First National, his wages were five times greater than the combined income of all nine members of the Supreme Court. But the film companies were happy to pay him a fortune as they knew that he'd still give them a profit. The government, though, was getting edgy. During the First World War, they tolerated him as he spoke at rallies in favour of the war, although right-wing groups sent him white feathers and harangued him for refusing to join the army. But then Chaplin became one of the millions who was inspired by the Russian Revolution and the government declared Chaplin a dangerous Bolshevist. And this at a time when America was pouring vast resources into defeating the Bolsheviks. Chaplin held a reception for the steelworkers leader, William Z. Foster, who later stood as communist candidate for president. So, on the one hand, he was ridiculously rich, and on the other hand, he was a rebel against the rich. And this contradiction was played out when he fell out with the studio bosses. They'd been complaining about the cost of Chaplin's films, and then he heard a rumour that they were planning a merger. So, together with Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, they formed their own film company, United Artists, forerunner to the company that still exists today. Even after the formation of United Artists, the next thing Chaplin wanted to control was the music. So he taught himself to play the violin and then to conduct. And from then on, he composed and arranged all the music for his own films. He created the famous scene in The Gold Rush, where the gold diggers are so starving that Chaplin serves up his shoes as dinner. He made the shoes out of licorice, but then insisted on retaking the scene over and over again for three days until he and his co-star, Max Swain, had eaten so much licorice that they both had diarrhoea. <laughs> BBC Radio broadcast the premiere of The Gold Rush, which consisted of listening to an audience that was watching a silent film. And Chaplin insisted on buying 21 dogs for his studio because of the importance of having trained dogs with comedy timing. He was obsessed with trying to find comedic or artistic solutions to every scene. And writing about this later, he said he detested the advent of the blockbuster movie. A super-duper special is the easiest picture to make. It requires little talent or imagination in acting or directing. So for long periods, he could think of nothing else apart from his films. And then this would be punctuated by short bursts of glittery engagements. When he came to London, he had lunch with Winston Churchill and he had a row with him because Churchill thought that Mahatma Gandhi should be jailed. And then a few days later, he went to East London and met Gandhi. In 1926, he became friends with Einstein. He went out with the President of France, the Queen of Spain, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was a regular guest of William Randolph Hearst. But it's not even clear that he likes these people. So why did he do it? Maybe it's because if you're from an ordinary background, when important posh people take an interest in you, you just can't help but be flattered. Perhaps half of him was thinking, what a bunch of useless, talentless parasites. And the other half was thinking, bloody hell, there's the Queen of Spain! But the people that Chaplin remembered most fondly from that time were a black truck driver, cigar makers, a prize fighter, and 